Good morning, I'm Joe Fryer. Savannah is on assignment. Right now on Morning News Now, here we go again. Brace yourselves because COVID cases are once again on the rise across the country and the nation's big cities are bearing the brunt of it right now. Here in New York City, for example, cases are up nearly 50% just over the last two weeks. It's also hitting some high profile officials, New York City Mayor Eric Adams, as well as House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Attorney General Merrick Garland. So what's behind this latest surge? What are the nation's top doctors saying about it? We're going to explain in a moment. New phase breaking news out of Ukraine this morning. Newly released images show a massive eight mile long Russian military convoy that appears to be heading for the Donbass region in the southeastern part of the country. President Zelensky now warning world leaders of Moscow's potential resurgence as civilians continue to flee their homes in the east, hoping to get away from the violence. We'll bring you the latest. Also this morning, supply scramble, a springtime holiday staple. Now the latest victim of the supply chain crunch. Why finding those Easter or Passover eggs might be a little more difficult and cost you a little bit more this year. Plus, Spellbound, it's a bona fide American tradition that's simultaneously been frustrating and delighting readers of the New York Times for 80 years. Later this hour, I'll introduce you to the man behind the magic of the paper's iconic crossword. To him, love is a nine-letter word, that word being crossword. Good to have you with us on this Monday, where the puzzle is a little bit easier, so we wish you a quick solve today. We'll have more of our interview with Will Shorts a little later this hour. We're going to begin this morning, though, with COVID cases on the rise here in the U.S. Over the last two weeks, they're up in more than two dozen states, and some areas could see the return of mask mandates. NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander has the very latest. Well, when the CDC shifted its mask guidance, officials said that only those living in high-risk areas needed to wear a mask indoors. But now that we're seeing numbers rising across the country, some local officials are trying to determine whether it's time to bring those back. This morning, with the nation's COVID case count once again on the rise, some city officials are facing a difficult question. Is it time to make masks mandatory again? I'm going to do it, but I can see that a lot of people are probably going to say no. Today in Philadelphia, where cases are up 89 percent, officials are expected to announce whether the city will reinstate an indoor mask mandate. It stinks, but, you know, we'll do what we have to do. Over the last two weeks, 27 states have seen a rise in cases. Experts say largely driven by the new BA2 variant, accounting for nearly three-fourths of all new cases. Right now, we're watching it very, very carefully. And there is concern that it's going up. In New York City, cases are up nearly 50 percent over the last two weeks. There is also a 76 percent increase in the nation's capital, where the number of high profile positive cases is growing after last week's A-list gridiron dinner. At least 72 people have tested positive after attending. Among them, three Biden cabinet members, New York City Mayor Eric Adams, and three members of Congress. There will be a level of infection. This is not going to be eradicated and it's not going to be eliminated. Mm. And what's going to happen is that we're going to see that each individual is going to have to make their calculation of the amount of risk that they want to take. But even with renewed focus on the nation's case count, some experts are questioning whether it's still an effective indicator, saying the number of daily COVID cases are dramatically undercounted, with more people using at-home tests. Just over three months ago, at the height of the Omicron wave, the U.S. was performing nearly two million tests a day. Now, that number is down to just over half a million. Others with mild symptoms choosing to skip the test altogether. And while we're watching numbers on the rise here in the U.S., we're also seeing them go up in other parts of the world, including China. In fact, the State Department has now issued a warning for Americans, urging them to reconsider travel to parts of China, including Shanghai, over restrictive COVID precautions. In Atlanta, I'm Blaine Alexander, NBC News. Blaine, thank you. Let's bring in NBC News medical contributor, Dr. Kavita Patel. Doctor, good to have you with us. So what do doctors know about this Omicron subvariant right now? Does it appear to be more contagious? And what are the symptoms like? Are they drastically different or not different from what we saw with Omicron over the winter? Yeah, Joe, here's what we know so far. We know that BA2, the subvariant that's dominant in the United States, is more infectious, more contagious, to your point, but not more severe. That's good news. And in terms of symptoms, it's really all over the map. We're seeing a lot of people present with that kind of original Omicron sore throat. We used to joke that Omicron starts in the throat and then goes to the rest of the body. 
BA2 has some of those features. We're also seeing patients who have stuffy noses, Joe. So you would think you have the common cold. And unless, kind of to Blaine's point, you really went and sought out a test, you might just dismiss it as just that, a common cold. And it could actually be the BA2 variant. And with all the masks gone, you could be unintentionally spreading it to others. So these numbers are dramatic as it is already, but NBC News has been speaking with disease experts who say incomplete data is really masking the rise in cases, especially since people now have so much access to at-home tests. We're not waiting in those long lines anymore for tests. How concerned are you about this? And what should people do if they're at home, take a test, and it's positive? What is it they're supposed to do? Yeah, what you're supposed to do is actually try to report it in. But depending on which city, county or state you're in, it might not be that easy. New York City and some other places have made it quite easy for you to be able to go on an app or at least send an email or call a, a number that's not a 911 number. I think it depends on your locality. But in general, most people are doing these at-home tests. And what I would recommend is that they actually get in touch with a health professional, whether it's a doctor or a pharmacy, to get a confirmation test if they're trying to make sure that they actually have it. If, if you have a rapid test and it's positive, it's positive. But many people want to get that PCR, which you generally have to do in an office. And we are, Joe, it's a tale of two cities. New York City, by the old CDC standards, is in a period of what we would call red or high transmission. By the new CDC standards, in a case of low community levels. Interesting. Yeah, hey, do not call 911 if you have a positive COVID test. We don't want anyone doing that. So we know right now, Dr. Patel, all 50 states have dropped their mask mandates. Do you expect, I mean, I, don't, I know many states probably won't bring them back, but do you think some are going to bring them back or is it too early to say? I do. And I think it's going to especially be kind of similar to where we see populations that can't get in vaccinated. So schools, we see this in New York City with younger with younger children under five. I do think some schools will look into whether by district they need to put masks back in as they look at cases rising and they don't want to start having virtual classes if children get sick. The key is keeping children in school. Some businesses might reinstate masks just to keep patrons coming in the doors and feeling protected. All right. Dr. Kavita Patel, as always, thank you so much for your expertise. We appreciate it. Now to Ukraine, which is preparing for the start of what could be a crucial week in its war with Russia. Over the weekend, the eastern Donbass region came under heavy shelling ahead of an expected Russian offensive. Yesterday, President Zelensky called for more Western help for the battle ahead. NBC News foreign correspondent Molly Hunter reports from Kiev in a warning. Her report contains images some may find disturbing. Now, the war is shifting east. The focus is turning east, and Russia is ramping up the next phase of this war. They have filled a key battlefield command post with a man known as the Butcher of Syria. He's accused of atrocities in Syria and carrying out the scorched earth policies that Russia has become so known for. This morning, President Volodymyr Zelensky delivering a dire warning, saying in a video address that it's likely tens of thousands of people are dead in the besieged city of Mariupol. Overnight, saying Ukraine is ready for the next phase of this war, but whether they can win, Zelensky says, depends on U.S. support, warning Russia is rapidly increasing its presence in the east. Satellite images showing an eight-mile column, hundreds of Russian military vehicles moving towards the city of Izium near Kharkiv on Friday. Zelensky telling CBS 60 Minutes, Ukraine needs bigger, better help and fast. All depends on how fast we will be helped by the United States. I have 100 percent confidence in our people and in our armed forces, but unfortunately I don't have the confidence that we will be receiving everything we need. I asked President Biden for very specific items. He has the list. Over the weekend, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson pledging $130 million in new military aid during his visit to Kyiv. Very, very, very glad to see you. How are you doing? The two leaders walking around the capital, sending a powerful message. The city many predicted would fall to Russia is still firmly in Ukrainian control. Over the weekend, the airport in Dnipro, Ukraine's fourth largest city, hit by Russian missiles twice. And in Kramatorsk, this morning, trains are still suspended. Civilians forced to find other ways to get out of the east. The death toll from Friday's attack, now at least 57 people. It's extremely difficult to even think about sitting down with people who uh, commit or uh, excuse or find, or find excuses for all these atrocities and war crimes. Whatever I feel, if I have the chance to save a human life or a village, a town from destruction, um, 
I will take that chance. And on 60 Minutes, President Zelensky asked about his expression in this photo from Bucha. It's anger. It's anger. Because we don't understand the Russians. You can't really understand this world. Now, Joe, I just want to show you where we are. We are on the Kiev side of this Irpin Bridge. This connects Irpin to the capital. We saw thousands and thousands of people evacuating from that bridge. Well, you can see they're building a temporary bridge so people can safely go back and forth. Behind me, there are a couple of people walking right here, Joe, but there is a mile and a half line of cars, people waiting. This is the first day they can go across this bridge, waiting to get back to their homes for the first time in weeks. Joe, I'll send it back to you. All right, Molly, thank you so much. Let's get more on this with Melinda Herring. She's the deputy director of the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center. Melinda, good to have you with us this morning. I do want to start with this impending battle for the Donbass region in eastern Ukraine. As we know, parts of this area are sympathetic to Russia, and the region includes those two self-declared separatist republics we were talking about before the war even started. So how different do you think this fight is going to be compared with what we saw in and around Kyiv? Morning, Joe. So this next phase of the war is going to be dramatically different. Kiev won the first phase, and just by the nature of, of the fight, it was a lot easier, and it was advantageous for Kiev. Kiev has civilian control of its military. It's embraced NATO standards. It has smaller uh, units that were able to, to attack Russia's longer units. It had a lot of advantages. Uh, in this next conflict, it's going to be advantageous to Russia. Uh, just by the nature of conflict. Russia uh, has been in the Donbass for eight years. It, it, the supply lines are closer to Russia, and it's going to look more like a, an old World War II-style conflict where, where troops are facing each other and using massive rocket systems. And Russia has a lot more than Ukraine does. So, Melinda, the powerful leader of Russia's Chechen Republic and a self-described foot soldier of Vladimir Putin says Russia will, quote, take Kiev and all other cities after its offensive in the Donbass. How much should we read into those comments? I mean, do you think it's likely Russia will go back for Kyiv again, or is that going to be even harder now to do again? Joe, I, I wish I could say that Kadyrov is spouting nonsense, which he is prone to do, but I think this is the game plan. So the Russians got their butts kicked over the last six weeks. They've retreated to the Donbass, and they have to make some gains there. Mariupol will likely fall, and they'll likely be able to make some gains in the Donbass and then they're going to start pushing again. There's another frightening essay from one of President Putin's advisors out today, and it says they're going to go after Europe next. Vladimir Putin is not willing to negotiate. He's angry. He's emotional. He bet the house. He bet his 21-year legacy on destroying Ukraine. This is not over. It's not going to be weeks. It's not going to be months. It's likely to be years, unfortunately. Which is so hard to hear. I mean, and with more and more weapons being sent to Ukraine, it does feel like we might be getting further away from any sort of ceasefire. Are, are you worried that not enough is being done diplomatically by the West to try and bring this conflict to an end? Or do you think there's just not much that can be done right now? I mean, is there any path out of this war right now through peace talks? No. So this, this is going to sound Orwellian, but the path to peace is through war. Ukraine has to hold its territory and it has to inflict major costs on Russia so that Russia is willing to compromise. There's a lot of analysts that think that uh, Russia has two to three months left of capable soldiers. So if the Ukrainians can wear them down, they can get a decent deal at the negotiating table. Unfortunately, a lot of people are going to die. This butcher of Syria, who now appears to be in charge of the Russian war effort, how worried are you about this? I think it's interesting because the Russians were really disorganized in the first phase. They had at least four different generals, and they were not talking very much. And we saw the results, right? There were fuel shortages. There's huge morale problems. There's discipline problems. And they couldn't take—they took one major city. That's it, in six weeks. So th this could signal that the Russians are getting organized. I expect them to do better in this next phase. Melinda Herring, thank you so much for your analysis this morning. We appreciate it. Thank you. Time to get a check on your morning news now. Weather, NBC's Michelle Grossman is back with us. Hey, Michelle, good morning.
Good morning, Joe. And we have many seasons on the map today. We have 90s in Texas. We have severe uh, spring storms, so we're going to be watching severe weather today, Tuesday, also Wednesday. And we're watching heavy snowfall. So we do have winter alerts. And over the weekend, we did see heavy snowfall in western uh, Washington state. You could see that right here. We saw over a foot of snow in some spots. It's April, and we're going to add to that. And this was in the higher elevations. Now, this time of year, they're told to take you know the chains off the wheels, so they have some issues as they're driving around today. And we're going to see that over the next few days. So winter storm warning, that's where you see the pink on this map. We do have a blizzard warning too. That's in purple. And this is going to last for a few days. So these are alerts in place through Thursday. Now we could see one to two feet of snow. And in a lot of spots, this is really beneficial. We're really dry. We start out the season really strong and then we are dry for a few months. So this is going to be a good thing once it's said and done. Also really windy. We have wind alerts for 41 million people damaging winds, guess, gusting up to 80 miles per hour. We could see some blowing dirt down trees, also some power outages. So that's going to be a big story that we're going to be watching too. Now with that blowing wind, also some really dry terrain in the middle of the country, the central and southern plains. We have 13 million impacted by red flag warnings. This has been such a big story. It continues to be a big story because we have that drought in place. And we are looking at contrasting temperatures. So I mentioned those 90s in Texas, 91 degrees today in Dallas. That is 16 degrees above what is typical for this time of year. Back behind this front, we're looking at temperatures in the 40s. So in Boise, 46, at 16 degrees below, typical for this time of year. Even colder tomorrow, that's going to set the stage for that snow that I was just showing you. Rapid City, 41, that's 16 degrees below, typical, uh, below normal for this time of year. And still tomorrow in St. Louis, Little Rock, we're looking at temperatures in the 70s and 80s. Lubbock, you're going to be at 88 degrees. It's mild in the Northeast, finally. A little chilly this morning. We did have some frost advisories, but we're going to rebound pretty quickly this afternoon. And we'll finally feel like spring for many of us. New York City by Wednesday, 68 degrees, 77 by Thursday, 66 on Friday. That's still right around normal and better than what we have been. And D.C., you're looking good, too, with temperatures in the 80s and 70s this week. So as we look towards today, we're talking about that severe weather in the uh, southern plains into the mid-Mississippi Valley, that record warmth through Dallas. And, Joe, we're going to be watching that severe weather today, Tuesday, and also Wednesday. We'll keep an eye on it for you. All right, Michelle, thank you so much. Coming up this hour on Morning News Now, the shocking and untimely death of a rising star in the NFL, a freak highway accident amid some mysterious circumstances. What we know this morning about the death of Steelers QB Dwayne Haskins. Plus, why your Easter or Passover eggs might be a little harder to find this year and cost you a little bit more. That's coming up after the break. Police in Florida are investigating the shocking death of NFL quarterback Dwayne Haskins. The 24-year-old died over the weekend when investigators say he was hit by a truck while he tried to walk across an interstate highway. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock has the latest from South Florida. Dwayne Haskins' death was not only deeply saddening, but also confounding. Police say they have absolutely no idea why he was walking in the middle of an eight-lane highway, not far from where I'm standing, where two major interstates meet. The tragedy stunning his NFL and college families. On a busy stretch of highway in South Florida, a chilling call. Rising a vehicle versus pedestrian. Pedestrian was walking on the highway. That person turned out to be the Pittsburgh Steelers 24-year-old quarterback, Dwayne Haskins, a former star at Ohio State University. According to police, Haskins died after being struck by a dump truck. I said this individual uh, is going to have a major accident if uh, you don't get to him. Chris Stanley telling NBC's Miami station WTVJ that he dialed 911 as he watched cars veer out of the way, trying to avoid a man dressed in all black. It's just very disturbing. I just didn't understand the situation. His arms were a little bit uh, moving. Like uh, It might have been like he's waving. While the circumstances remain mysterious, the painful loss of a young player rippled through the football world. Dwayne, I was just with you, man. And I love you, brother. Steelers head coach Mike Tomlin writing in part, I am devastated and at a loss for words. He quickly became part of our Steelers family. Retired Steelers quarterback Ben Roethlisberger penning a letter. I only had the privilege to know DeHask for a short time, but in that time I got to meet a young man that didn't seem to ever have a bad day. He came to work every day with a smile on his face and energy and love in his heart. Buckeye Nation also in mourning for Haskins, who led Ohio State to a Rose Bowl victory in 2018. 
Former coach Urban Meyer telling the Columbus Dispatch he was one of the sweetest kids. The players all loved him. I'm just heartbroken for that family. As many reflected on the loss of a once promising prospect. He came here to turn his career around. And too young and life too short. Haskins is survived by his wife, his parents, and his younger sister, with whom he was reportedly extremely close. Police say that the truck driver stayed on scene, cooperated with authorities, and they're expecting a full report within three to four months. In Fort Lauderdale, Sam Brock, NBC News. Sam Brock, thank you. Let's take a look at what's making news around the world this morning. NBC's Claudio Lavanga joins us from Rome. Claudio, good morning. Good morning, Joel. The Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi is expected to travel to Algeria today as part of an effort by Italy to find alternative sources of natural gas and reduce its dependency from Russia. Right now, 40% of the natural gas imported by uh, Italy comes from Russia, while so far, at least so far, Algeria was Italy's second largest supplier. And the Chinese port of Guangzhou has banned all non-essential travel today as the country continues to see a surge in COVID-19 cases again. Now, it has only granted leave to residents, uh, to leave to residents with a definitive need, or whatever that means. And now, while there has not been a lockdown in place, schools have been switched to remote learning and the local administration prepares to undergo citywide mass testing. And last but not least, Queen Elizabeth attended at least virtually the official opening of a new unit at the Royal London Hospital named after her. The Queen Elizabeth unit consists in two new floors at the hospital meant to accommodate COVID-19 patients. Now, the 1995-year-old monarch has called off many in-person appearances recently, but she wanted to nevertheless thank Personally, the British nurses and doctors who've been on the front line of the fight against COVID-19 since the start of the pandemic. All right, Claudio, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Now, just days before Passover and Easter, the price of a spring staple, eggs, is soaring. It's forcing some to actually rethink their holiday traditions. NBC News correspondent Emily Aketa joins us with more on this latest shortage. Emily, good morning. Good morning, Joe. So we've seen the price of feed for animals and the supply chain crisis already impact our grocery bills. Well, to make matters worse, now a highly infectious avian flu is forcing U.S. farmers to kill millions of egg-laying birds from Wyoming to Maine, and it couldn't come at a worse time. Colorfully painted eggs are synonymous with spring, but just days out from Easter and Passover, and you may have trouble finding or affording the staple. Ridiculous. I'm going to go buy chickens because I just spent $8.99 on 30 eggs. Terrible. The wholesale price for eggs is nearly three times as much as last year, surpassing $3 a dozen at the end of March, which has only happened once before, according to market researchers. The soaring costs, driven in part by a bird flu outbreak that's spreading like wildfire in more than half the country, leading to the deaths of millions of birds. The virus is rarely transmitted to humans, but it's hurting people's wallets, especially those with the ingredient baked in to their business. So you got an invoice, the prices were nearly double. What was your reaction? I thought there was a mistake. <laughs> Bakery owner Renee Ferris goes through some 700 eggs a week and even more ahead of holiday weekends. Could the timing be worse? No, <laughs> it actually can't. It's pretty bad. Um, all of our stuff that is on our menu uses a lot of eggs. The bird flu outbreak comes as food prices are already on the rise. My grocery bills have skyrocketed. Milk surging by 11% in the past year. Butter up more than 5%. Candy, 7%. The USDA predicting groceries could increase another 4% by the end of 2022. Thanks, Souring even the sweetest of traditions. We most likely will be dying less eggs due to the price of them. I don't want to raise my prices, but unfortunately we might have to. And I've noticed that a lot of businesses are raising their prices. Raspberry but after surviving the past two years, Ferris is confident her customers will help her weather any storm. We have a great support system and we have a really great community, so it makes it worth it in the end. So the good news is industry experts say the supply of eggs is tight, but not to an alarming degree. So we're not facing toilet paper level shortages yet. Plus, it's the retailers seeing the biggest price hike in eggs right now, and not all the stores are passing those costs on to consumers, though analysts Joe warn that probably won't stay the case for long.
Maybe you could just go with like Cadbury eggs this Easter for everything. Yeah, I'm all for it. Yeah, well, I don't know if that'd make for a good omelet. All right, Emily, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Coming up today marks one year since the death of Dante Wright, the 20-year-old black man who was fatally shot by a police officer during a traffic stop in Minnesota. We're going to have more on the new app developed to try and prevent another tragedy. That's next. A Texas district attorney says he will not prosecute a woman who was arrested and charged with murder for her alleged role in an abortion. Now, in a statement, the DA said in part, in reviewing applicable Texas law, it is clear that the woman cannot and should not be prosecuted for the allegation against her. We should note it's unclear if the woman was being accused of having an abortion herself or for helping with someone else's. NBC News correspondent Katie Beck joins us now. So, Katie, first, let's just bring everyone up to speed. I mean, abortion is still a protection right in America. So, so why was this woman even arrested in the first place? Yeah, good morning, Joe. It's a really good question and it's certainly stirring a lot of outrage among protesters there along the border in Texas in the small community of Star County. A lot of people wanting more information. There simply isn't a lot of public information about exactly what statute that woman was charged under. Uh, because as you said, in the state of Texas, it is actually not permitted to charge a pregnant woman with a self-induced abortion with homicide. That is actually not permitted under the law. And of course, as we know, the law that's gotten a lot of attention in Texas, SB 8, which was passed in September, is the strictest abortion law in the country, but it only carries a civil penalty. This woman obviously being charged with homicide is a criminal charge. So the DA, the sheriff, uh, they are sort of walking this back now, as you see the DA saying uh, that he is going to drop this charge. But initially what she was charged under uh, is still unclear at this point. I think we'll probably find that out later this morning when there's a court hearing. Yeah, we heard a little bit of the statement from the DA there. Did the DA give much more information about why they decided not to press charges? Um, basically, in his statement, he was emphatically clear that this is not a criminal matter and that she should not have been charged. Um, he actually mentioned that this has been quite traumatic for her and her family and um, that he was seeking to dismiss these charges as soon as possible, as soon as the courts opened, uh, that basically, you know, the sheriff there was given a case he investigated and that basically under the law, uh, this charge holds no real weight. So it looks as though they are clearly admitting a mistake or some type of miscalculation of Texas law at this point. But where that is yet to be seen, we'll hopefully get those answers when they have their hearing this morning. Katie, what has been the reaction to this case in Texas? Well, it has drawn folks from all over the state to come in support of this woman and demand her release. She was arrested on Thursday, released on bond on Saturday. Um, but obviously, th this case, as soon as it hit, uh, you know, the media, got a ton of attention from, you know, abortion rights advocates that got out there and said, you know, this is unfair, this is illegal, this woman is being held illegally, detained illegally. And there is no charge criminally for her to be charged with homicide of a self-induced abortion, which is what that indictment says. It's gone from a local yeah. story to a national one very quickly. Katie Beck, thanks so much for your reporting. Appreciate it. Today, President Biden is expected to take steps aimed at reducing gun violence. Two people with knowledge of the announcement tell NBC News the president will roll out new executive orders to tighten gun control and gun regulations, as well as address concerns regarding so-called ghost guns. Those are weapons that can be 3D printed at home. Now, as part of the rollout, President Biden is also expected to name a replacement to lead the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives. The White House withdrew its last nominee last September following unanimous opposition from Republicans. Today marks one year since the death of Dante Wright in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota. He was the 20-year-old man fatally shot during a traffic stop by a police officer who says she mistakenly drew her gun instead of her taser. A vigil will be held tonight to mark the anniversary. Now, a free subscription to an app is being offered to everyone in Brooklyn Center. It lets them connect with a lawyer live if they're pulled over by police. NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster joins us now with more on this. Shaq, good to see you. So explain to us how this app works and why it is being made available to residents there. 
Good morning, Joe. Well, the app is called Turn Signal, and with either voice command or a touch of a button, it essentially starts recording the front camera during an interaction with police. It will also automatically start a video conference, putting a lawyer in the front seat of your car to help de-escalate or to just simply give that legal advice. It's an app that normally costs about $6.99 a month or $60 a year, but for residents of Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, the place where Dante Wright was killed a year ago today, it is being offered for free for about 3,000 residents. It's through a partnership with Blue Cross Blue Shield. So this is an app that is pretty new. It's just been rolled out in less than the past, in recently uh, within the past year, but it's something that many people are starting to experience for the first time. So Shaq, you spoke with the creators of Turn Signal. What sort of impact did Dante Wright's death have on their creation of it? And just overall, what inspired them to launch this? Yeah, Joe, you know, they started working on this app before the death of Dante, right? They were about 40 days away from actually launching it at that point. But they say they got together after the murder of George Floyd. There are two NBAs, one who was a lawyer, and they said they wanted to bring their talents together to help be part of the solution. And that's what they uh, did. They created this app. And I want you to listen to a little bit of my interaction with them and when I asked them what they, why they started this and what is this about? What's the purpose behind this? We are not a police monitoring app. We're here to, to protect those interactions, and that's why de-escalation is a cornerstone, but also why we met with over 20 police officers in Minnesota alone before we launched the app to say, hey, this is what we're looking to do. We built this app for people that look like Chaz, Andre, and myself, but as Black we, men. Black men. And as we've grown, we've found that we can really use this app in many places. So as we think about parents of, of young teenage drivers that don't necessarily know what the do's and don'ts are of being behind the wheel of a vehicle. Right now, this app is available in three states, Minnesota, California, and Georgia. They have about 10,000 downloads and so far have had about 2,000 users. So, Shaq, what's the reaction from police, from law enforcement there in Minnesota? Well, you heard them mention there that they got and built this app through the help and advice of members of law enforcement, talking to 20 members of law enforcement. I had a conversation with one of those officers, a police chief of the St. Cloud Police Department, who helped advise them as they were creating this app. Listen to what he told me. But my initial reticence was because it has the potential to divide our attention. So I've, I've come around to the viewpoint that so long as uh, whoever is on the other end of that phone isn't escalating, and if it brings comfort to, to someone that gets pulled over on a traffic stop, so it's important to note, he says that none of his officers have encountered anyone using the app. I mentioned this is still relatively new, so it remains to be seen what the reaction from members of law enforcement will ultimately be. We did reach out to the Brooklyn Center uh, Police Union. They declined to comment for this story, but you get the sense that he at least is open to the idea of someone in that car helping to de-escalate what is usually and could be a tense situation. All right. Shaq reporting from Brooklyn Center. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Coming up on Morning News Now, beach bums beware, or beach lovers too. We're going to tell you about the spring break stingers that could put a damper on your surfside getaway if you don't watch your step. Plus, it's crunch time for your taxes, how you can take the stress out of this final week before what could be a nightmare season next year. That's all up next. With spring break in full swing, lots of people are beachbound, but officials are warning of a dangerous visitor that might be there, too. NBC News senior national correspondent Carrie Sanders is in the Lauderdale by the Sea, Florida area with a serious warning. Hey, Carrie. Well, if you're uh, down on spring break or if you're just a regular beach go, you may have seen these mysterious creatures. They're very colorful, which is why kids are so curious and drawn to them. They're in the water and they're washing up on the sand at the beach. And all of that is really kind of a warning because while they look like jellyfish, they are Portuguese man of wars and they have a very, very powerful sting. And if you get hit by that, well, you will not forget it. And all of this, of course, is happening right now as folks are heading to the beach. 
From Florida to Texas to the Carolinas, these glistening balloon-like sea creatures called Portuguese man-o-wars are literally setting sail as beach season kicks off. A shifting wind pattern will sometimes force hundreds of the individuals up onto shore where they're washed up on the beach. Lifeguards flying purple flags to warn of the lurking danger. Portuguese man are, are, are pretty terrible. They, they are very, very painful. Their tentacles dangling as long as 165 feet below the surface are loaded with toxins that can sting you even after they're dead and wash ashore. 20-year-old college student Hannah Almanzar was stung while on spring break in Florida. She says she felt a slight pinch on her chest within minutes of entering the water. I thought at first it was just like my bathing suit. And then I felt it was just like kind of like burning everywhere else. Almanzar rushed to the ER for help, where she received an injection of an anti-inflammatory medicine for the increasing pain. I kind of thought for a moment that I'm like either was going to die or was going to be close to it just because of how bad it, like just how bad the pain was because I never felt anything like that. While man of wars are found in tropical waters year round, they are spotted more frequently on U.S. coasts in the spring and summertime. Experts say if you do get stung, vinegar is your best bet. Spray or pour it on the wound to neutralize the venom. Do not touch the area with your hands. Instead, scrape the skin with an object like a credit card to remove the residue. And make sure to soak the area in hot water to get rid of any remaining toxins. Portuguese Man Award, it's an odd name. First of all, you're probably wondering, are they arriving from Portugal? No, uh, the wind is blowing them up the Atlantic and around in the Gulf of Mexico, but they're called Portuguese Man Award because back in the 1800s, when folks saw them looking down, they saw that bubble that kind of looked like the warship from Portugal known as a Portuguese Man of War. And so they just got named Portuguese Man of War. Bottom line is, they do sting, and you don't want to encounter them. Just stay clear. Parents, if you see it with your kids running towards it, get them away. They will never forget what happened to them if they do get stung. Yeah, and no kidding. As you heard, Joe, they could even be dead, and they still have that venom. So just stay clear. That's incredible. If that purple flag is out, be, be quite aware. All right, Kerry Sanders, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Time now for our CNBC Money Minute, the biggest financial headlines of the day and why they matter to you. Bertha Coombs is back with us. Hey, Bertha. Hey, Joe. So if you love those blue potato chips on JetBlue, well, you'll still get them, but they are trimming the summer schedule in an attempt to avoid flight disruptions as they ramp up hiring. Spokesperson confirming to CNBC an email that says capacity has already been cut 8 to 10 percent in May, and there may be similar sized cuts through the summer. U.S. Airlines are trying to speed up hiring, but like everybody else, they are struggling as they prepare for an expected spike in summer travel demand. Meantime, Chinese electric vehicle maker NIO is halting production as COVID lockdowns disrupt its supply chain. The company posting a statement online saying there will be a delay of deliveries of new vehicles. Uh, uh, rivals Tesla and Volkswagen have also temporarily shut facilities in China due to that lockdown. NIO currently only sells in China and Norway, but has aimed to expand to the U.S. and several other countries by 2025. And prices at the pipe are easing back just a little bit, the average price dropping 10 cents nationwide in the past two weeks to 4.27 a gallon as oil prices continue to fluctuate. Analysts say the move can be chalked up partially to lower demand during the second half of March. Gas prices are still more than a buck 30 higher than they were this time last year. Another thing folks will be watching for, Joe, is whether you know states and the federal government will ease back on the taxes. That will probably be the biggest drawdown in terms of the price on a uh, price of gasoline. Yeah, absolutely. Something to keep an eye on. All right, Bertha, thanks so much. Appreciate it. All right, another big business story. The deadline to file your tax returns is quickly approaching. And for Americans who have not finished their taxes this year, 
The next week is likely going to be a stressful one. Here to help us navigate the filing deadline is Ryan Ellis, the president of the Center for a Free Economy and an IRS enrolled agent. Good to have you with us, Ryan. So, all right, I'm looking at my watch here, April 11th, which means we got exactly a week. What advice would you give to those Americans out there? We know they're out there who have not filed their taxes yet. And what can they do to maybe try and reduce the stress of getting everything done on time? Well, there's always a few out there, as you say. Uh, and the most important thing that people can do if they're not in any position to file in the next week is to file for an extension. So an extension gives you an additional six months in order to file your taxes. It's important to know that, that an extension to file is not an extension to pay. So if you think you're going to owe, you should send in a payment with that extension. Also, don't forget about doing an extension for your state income taxes. But don't rush your taxes. If you are in a position where you're not ready to actually file yet, Take that extension under consideration because doing that extension is a lot better than doing your taxes late. If you do your taxes late without an extension, there's something called a failure to file penalty, which is one of the worst penalties in the tax code and hits people really, really hard, completely unnecessarily. Doing an extension is very, very easy, and uh, everybody who's not done probably should do it today. Good advice there. Now, a lot of Americans received some form of stimulus payment from the government during the pandemic. These payments obviously very helpful at the time, but they've also created some headaches for people when they have to report them on their tax returns. Walk us through some of the problems you're seeing and then what do you do to solve those problems? Well, 2021 was a very unusual year. So back in March, Congress passed a COVID recovery bill, which did a third round of COVID stimulus. People might remember from 2020, they kept getting these direct deposits into their bank accounts. A third one came in in roughly March or April of about $1,400 per person in your household. So you have to keep track of that because you've got to report that on your taxes. It's not taxable, but you do have to report it. If you didn't keep your letter from the IRS, you're going to have to go back into your bank account in order to, in order to find it. Then in the second half of the year, uh, Congress was giving half of your anticipated child tax credit in pieces every month between July and December. So uh, if you didn't keep the letter from the IRS that said how much of that you got, you're going to have to go through your bank account every month from July through December and see what kind of child tax credit payment you got. That's a burden that taxpayers haven't had before, and it's very unique to 2021. So, Ryan, yeah, I have to ask you, you wrote a piece for The Wall Street Journal recently previewing next year's tax season, which you say will be a, quote, nightmare. So you're not sugarcoating it there. Why is that? And what are some of the new rules people should know about? Well, there's this IRS form called the 1099-K. We think about 20 million of them are probably going to go out. They're going to hit uh, anyone who uh, uses a credit card, a debit card, a service like Venmo or Zelle or PayPal. Um, you know, people that have been using those services up until now haven't had to deal with a 1099-K unless they were a business taxpayer who had at least 200 transactions on that one of those services and ran at least $20,000 of business revenue through one of those services. Well, Congress, in its infinite wisdom, lowered that for 2022 to one transaction. All you have to do is use it once, and all you have to have is $600 of aggregate activity going on through one of those. So if, if PayPal or Zoom or uh, MasterCard or Visa or whoever's doing these services thinks you're a business taxpayer, you're going to get a 1099K. If you are selling things on eBay or Facebook Marketplace, let's say you have some old junk in your garage that you're selling, even at a personal loss, they're going to assume you're a business taxpayer. You're going to get a 1099K. You're going to get it and say, what the heck do I do with this thing? Uh, and then at that point, you're, you're either going to have a big IRS bill or you're going to have a big IRS headache. Either way, you won't know how to handle it. All right. Ryan Ellis, lots of advice here. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Absolutely. Coming up, the return of Benefer, entertainment's ultimate power couple engaged again. Plus, the, magic, the man behind the magic of the New York Times crossword, how he continues to keep things fresh and frustratingly challenging after 80 years of the paper's perplexing puzzle. That's after the break. Big news for fans of Jennifer Lopez and Ben Affleck. Benifer is back, the star couple making it official and announcing their engagement in a special video on JLo's Instagram account. NBC News Now anchor Morgan Radford joins us now with the latest on this rekindled romance. Morgan, good morning. Good morning. The pair, as you mentioned, nicknamed Benifer by fans, has drummed up quite the excitement after rekindling their love a year ago. And then on Friday, Lopez shared that she and Affleck are engaged once again. So I have a really... Um 
exciting <laughs> and special story to share. Jennifer Lopez released this video so viewed more than physical. six million times on her Instagram Friday, asking fans to go to her website for a big announcement. In the video, Lopez appears emotional as she looks down at the large green diamond ring on her hand. The singer shared in a previous newsletter the special meaning behind the color. I always say the color green is my lucky color. Lopez's sister sharing the engagement with this post on her Instagram story, writing, so this happened. This love story two decades in the making. Lopez and actor Ben Affleck first met on the set of the romantic comedy Gigli in 2001. Hello. I'm sorry. Do we know each other? Not yet. The pair's relationship soon set off a media frenzy. And it didn't take long before Affleck popped the question in July of 2002 with a pink diamond ring. But just as fast as their love grew, their relationship came to an abrupt end. In September 2003, just days before their highly anticipated wedding, the couple released a statement postponing their nuptials, citing excessive media attention. Then, in January 2004, the couple confirmed they were splitting up. Fast forward nearly 20 years later. After separate marriages, kids, and successful careers, the couple confirmed they were officially back together in 2021. Lopez telling Hoda and Savannah in February. Yeah. I think what we learned from the last time is that uh, love, when you are lucky enough to find it, is so sacred and special, and you have to hold a little bit of that privately, but we're very happy. If no word yet on when the wedding will be. Well, that ring has been estimated to be well over $10 million. In fact, according to the CEO of the Diamond Pro, he tells us in a statement, in my 20 years working in the diamond industry, I have never seen such an exquisite diamond ring. Back my to goodness, you. that is saying yeah. something. All right, I can't, I want to see this wedding. That is what I Jenny want to see. Jenny from the block with a big old rock. No kidding, my goodness. All right, thank you, Morgan, appreciate it. Of course. It. All right, it has been 80 years since the beloved New York Times crossword made its debut. Whether you're someone who breezes through the Sunday puzzle or you struggle with the easier Monday puzzle, crossword fans across the country are united by their love of the New York Times puzzle. Years now, these tiny boxes have given us a lot to unpack. I think we as humans have a natural compulsion to fill empty spaces. We are drawn to fill empty spaces. Like these 10 empty spaces, I'll give you a clue. The fourth editor of the New York Times crossword. Answer, Will Shorts. I love the job, but it's partly that I love puzzles. I like to test people. A love reflected in his college major, a 12 letter word for the study of puzzles, enigmatology. Here's a copy of the first crossword book. Shorts' home is like a crossword museum packed with history. You certainly won't find any empty spaces here. I have more than 25,000 puzzle books and magazines dating back to 1533. He's even appeared in TV shows like The Simpsons. New York Times crossword editor Will Shorts. And How I Met Your Mother. Thank you, Will Shorts. Hired in 1993, Shorts has now edited more than 10,000 puzzles. Why do you think it's endured for so long? You know, we like to play with language. We like to challenge ourselves. We like the twists that come in the clues. The paper's puzzles are made by contributors. Shorts gets about 200 submissions a week. Says the crossword constructors are getting younger. When he started, the average age was early 50s. Now it's mid 30s. One day, you know, I was looking and I realized, well, there's a byline. Somebody makes these crosswords. Why couldn't that be me? Joel Faliano's first puzzle was published when he was a high school senior. Today at age 29, he's a digital puzzles editor for The Times and creates the mini crossword. The New York Times crossword is famously hard and we wanted to create a more accessible version of the puzzle. He's one of six now on the Times crossword team. Variety of ages and backgrounds, each bringing their own viewpoint to this eight decade tradition. I mean, I grew up, you know, watching my dad solve the puzzle and to know now that every puzzle that he solves, I had a hand in creating uh, is, is an amazing thing. What does your dad think of what you do? He loves it. Uh, you know, he occasionally, We'll have the clue here or there that he objects to, and he'll let me know. 
connecting generations through a nine-letter word for a legend that endures. Crossword. I will keep doing puzzles forever. If you get tired of puzzles, there is something wrong with you. So in recent months, Wordle has grown in popularity. That's a puzzle that only takes a few minutes to finish usually. Of course, it was purchased by the Times recently, and Shorts thinks it is luring more people than to crosswords, especially younger folks who can easily access crosswords online and on apps instead of the old-fashioned way pen and paper, or perhaps more realistically, pencil and paper. That does it for this hour of Morning News Now. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.